last week, we titled the message, Jesus Wins, and we looked at his coming in, uh, in his majesty on a white steed. He came to rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, we discovered from the text. Today, the message is entitled, Satan Loses. Jesus Wins and Satan Loses. That idea is the primary thrust of this text that we'll study today to reveal how bad off Satan is and his cronies are and their eternal destination that awaits them and for those who are wrapped up in the same way that they live in. But there are six verses in this section and in those six verses, something is mentioned, a thousand years. Six verses in this book, an entire theological frameworks have been built upon those six verses. So we can't pass it by or avoid it, which I have not sought to avoid anything, but I just want you to know that... Uh, it's important to discuss it for a moment, though it's, my approach has been different for most of this book. In these six verses, we see, as I've already mentioned, a thousand-year period of time described in each of those six verses, verses 2 through 7. And this idea of this thousand-year period of time Though theological frameworks can see it alluded to other places, really the only distinct place that that exact period of time and this millennium, this reign is, um, is mentioned. Now that's not to say that it's not important. It is important. Entire theological frameworks have been built upon these six verses. But what I'm afraid that we will do if I'm going to try to tackle each of those and try to explain to you what those are and what they mean um, in this period of time that I have remaining in the service, I think we'd miss the, the point of the passage by getting wrapped up in this idea and these thoughts. Now, I'm not going to pass it by. I just want you to know I'm going to briefly explain it, but then I'm going to go to what I think is the main point because I don't want to miss the main point. That's what I've sought to do all along is we've studied the book of Revelation. But we can't pass it by. I need to deal with it for just a moment and help you understand what's going on as best I can and then we'll move to what's, real, what's the main point of that passage. This thousand-year reign is often called the millennium reign of Christ. And when it takes place is the point of many divisions over many centuries in many people who are orthodox believers. There are people who believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, who believe solidly, solidly in the theological mentality that you and I would believe and they come to different conclusions and unfortunately where they stand on these six verses and when that's going to happen can cause division and part of that division and the things that divide us is part of the reason I've approached the book of Revelation the way that I have not seeking to identify when things are going to happen or when I think things might happen or you know what is happening in the news and whether or not that's directly correlated to the book of Revelation or not you may realize there's a big giant thing happening in the news right now with Israel and Hamas we mentioned it last week briefly I don't want to act like I've got my head stuck in the sand. I, I certainly realize that what is happening there has eternal significance, has significance for our lives today. And 
is a result of what Jesus said, that there will be wars and rumors of war. But if I were to try to go into the depths of Revelation and other prophetical books and try to say, well, I think this is talking about that and this kind of stuff, I think we'd miss the point of what's really actually there. And so I don't want to be naive or seem naive, but I do want to help you to see what I think the point of all this is. But I also want to avoid division because I don't think division is necessary. Because at the end of the day, none, none of us know and uh, exactly when it's going to happen. We will just have to trust Jesus in the midst of that. Now, this is not typically how I preach, and so, uh, but I want to get into these things just very briefly and then move to the text. There are three theological frameworks built from these six verses, and throughout the ages, many uh, sound theologians have believed any one of them, all right? And that's how to view when this millennium, when these thousand years are going to take place. Those are premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. You didn't know you were going to come to church today and have a, a seminary level course, did you? And learn all se these seminary uh, uh, words. I'll break them down very quickly and help you understand which one, uh, which each one means. Um, Premillennialism believes that the second coming of Jesus comes before this thousand year reign. Most, for, for most of history, uh, especially recent history, Southern Baptists, Baptists typically hold to some form of premillennialism. Now, you can get in, <laughs> this is where it just gets real messy, and again, while we're not going to spend a lot of time on these things, but even within premillennialism, there's three different views of when the rapture will come. And so, you can see that's just really complicated, and, and uh, if you have questions about this, I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards, but that's not the point of this text, I don't think, the main point of the text, certainly part of it. Uh, but they believe the second coming of Christ will occur before the millennium happens. Um, Postmillennialism believes that the second coming of Christ comes after the millennium. Um, and, and there's a lot to that. Uh, th again, the goal is not to get into all of this, but it believes that that is going to happen afterwards. I, I would say... Not many people believe post-millennialism these days, that, but people in the past have. Jonathan Edwards, Charles Wesley, and others. And then there's amillennialism. And if you place ah before a word, typically it means no. And those people believe basically that the millennium is symbolic, largely symbolic, and there is no literal millennium. So you see, this, these six verses have caused quite a controversy. There's three main theological ways to view it even those have nuances within them and while it's important and while I wish I were smart enough to tell you which one to believe I'd rather look at the scriptures with you and let you draw your own conclusion which takes time more time than we have today because in the midst of this introduction and this little description of the millennium, something far more important is happening in the passages. We see something so eternally significant that if we focus on how long this millennium is and, and when, it, or when it's going to happen, whether it's literal or not, all those kind of things, then we may miss what the most amazing part, and that is Satan is eternally vanquished. In this passage of Scripture, we see Satan and his way that has run amok for millennia is completely wiped out and decimated. And that should give us amazing hope for our lives, not only in the future, but our lives today. 
Because I don't want you to fret about tomorrow. I want you to learn how to live in confidence today and tomorrow. I found a quote uh, on Facebook. I really appreciate Tony Evans. and He's um, posted on social media. I'm, I think he has a new book on prophecy. Of, you know, certainly uh, significant considering his comments on what's happening in Israel as well. And he, he said some things that I think really resonate with me and I think will be helpful to you as to how we should look at prophecy and try to understand it. And he says this, he says, the reason you are to study prophecy is not to satisfy your curiosity. You study prophecy in order to learn how to function and live now while we wait for Christ's return. So what can happen with all this mess going on is that we can fret. And friends, you and I as Christ followers are not meant to fret. We have a Savior who is powerful and Jesus wins and Satan in his ways of life and the way he has tried to rule this world poorly will ultimately be decimated and vanquished. And that should give us hope. And then Tony Evans is saying the same thing. He continues, he says, a good understanding of prophecy can give us a reference point for living. A good understanding of prophecy can give us a reference point for living. When a farmer wants to plow a straight furrow, he picks out a marker at the other side of the field and keeps his eyes on it as he plows. You need a reference point when you're looking into the future. If you're just entering college and you want to be a doctor, that's your reference point. Your goal will determine what courses you take and the path you follow. You all must, you all most certainly set your sights on medical, you will most certainly set your sights on medical school, he's saying if you're a doctor. And he continues, he says, the Bible says if you fix your sights and your hope on Christ's coming, that perspective on tomorrow will influence your thoughts and choices today. Understanding prophecy can help you stay on God's kingdom path so that you can produce fruit for eternity and stay calm in life's storms. And I think that's the point of today's passage as well, to help you and I to stay calm, to stay calm in life's storms in our life. And I pray that you'll find that hope in the passage today. If you would, would you, for, to honor God's word, would you stand as we read his word and, and pray that it gives us courage to face today and tomorrow. And it says here, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. And after that, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and we'll continue looking at the rest of the passage, verse 7 through 10, in just a moment. I just want you to realize and understand in this passage is that your enemy, Satan, is already defeated. Today, today he is defeated. Satan has no power in your life if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
Because of Jesus and because Jesus has won and will win, which we learned last week, you have power in your life that is more powerful than our enemy. And we see here his ultimate demise, but he is even defeated today. Look what Jesus did at the cross and look, look how this is described in John 12, 31 through 32. This is what Jesus is saying just before he's about to go to the cross himself. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He indicated, he said this to indicate what kind of death he's about to die on. On a cross. And so Jesus at the cross defeated Satan. Jesus at the cross took away the power Satan has over you and me. If we have Jesus Christ as our Savior and the Holy Spirit dwells within us, then Satan's already rendered powerless in your life and in my life. Isn't that good news? Isn't that wonderful to think about? Yeah, praise God for that. Now, does it mean that Satan doesn't run amok? Does it mean that Satan won't try to trip you up and deceive you? And you see in this passage that that's all he knows how to do. Deceive, 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 deceive. But, and, and we must be sober-minded with this. We shouldn't just walk around like we can just do whatever we want and Satan's not going to get us from one side or the other or try to trip us up or whatever. Because Scripture tells us, Peter tells us, be sober-minded, be, vi be vigilant for your... Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Paul told us in Ephesians 6 that we ought to put on the, the armor of God to, uh, to, to uh, extinguish the darts that Satan throws our way. But Jesus is more powerful than Satan. And if Jesus is reigning in your life and my life, Satan has no power over us. Because, and our first point is, Satan succumbs to the power of Jesus. Satan succumbs to the power of Jesus. In this moment, Jesus is exalted on this white horse in all his majesty, robed, robed in white with a, dip, a blood stain in, on his robe because he purchased our pardon by his death on the cross. And immediately after we're able to see Jesus in all his majesty, immediately in this passage, we see Satan locked up, put away. He has no power over Jesus. I'm reminded of Jesus' last encounter with Satan before this moment, and he was in the wilderness, led, by there, led there by the Holy Spirit, and Satan didn't have power over Jesus then. He thought he did. He tried to exert power over him. He said, hey, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms in the world. And he says, God told me not to worship anybody but him. He quoted God's word directly to Satan, and Satan went away with his tail between his legs. Satan has no power over Jesus and here in this moment in the book of Revelation, as John sees this vision unveiled, we see Jesus in unveiled power. The first things to accomplish when he's in his, this majestic state is to exert his infinite power over Satan and all of his cronies with him. Now, I will admit, and you and I can admit, there are times where it seems like Satan seems to have a lot of power in our lives. Because, but because you have the Spirit dwelling in you, because you belong to Jesus, Satan must succumb to Jesus' power in you. Even now. That's why Paul tells us that we can mount up with the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the Spirit, and the shield of faith. And we can pray to God. And it even tells us that when we resist the devil, he will flee from us. 
Satan succumbs to the power of Jesus. The second thing we see is Satan is able to be resisted and has no power over God's people. What you see in this passage is you see, you see people who, who were put to death. And you may think, well, you just said that Satan has no power over them. How did they die? They died in obedience and they realized that death is not the end for a Christian. That death is not of any consequence to a Christian. In fact, Scripture tells us, death, oh, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And in death, there is no victory because of Christ. And what they understood is that they would one day rise again. And Jesus has a way of bringing dead things to life. He spoke and Lazarus walked again. Jesus himself came out of the grave three days later. He was dead, but then he was alive. And you and I, because of Jesus' resurrection, we have hope in our resurrection one day that when we do die, Christ will raise us again to life eternal, to life in him. You and I are here in this moment if we are Christians The Bible tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but Jesus brought us eternal life. What was dead now lives. What we see is that Satan has no power over these people. Those who died are resisting Satan's power, rise again to reign with Christ when this millennium takes place, whenever that is. And they're exalted because of their ability to withstand the attacks of Satan. You see, Satan has no power over us. These folks were willing to go to the grave. They didn't receive the identifying marks, right? The mark on the hand, the mark on the the forehead, the, the taking the name of Satan, which we talked about months and months and months ago. This this symbolic mark. They were killed in horrendous ways, but Satan didn't get his way. The passage shares that the way these people died was gruesome. Some beheaded. It reminds us that we don't have to listen to Satan's whims, attacks, or trickery because what he would love for people to believe is, follow me and you can have all that you want. You don't have to to face death but what he doesn't realize is that death has no power over those who are in Christ because Christ brings life again Christ brings resurrecting lives resurrecting life to you and I perhaps you and I may need to have courage like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego do you remember that story? You and I learned it as little kids, perhaps. Maybe we haven't thought about it in quite some time. Maybe, maybe you even remember it being placed on a felt board. Anybody? I did, I did, yeah. And that's the story of the fiery furnace. Do you remember that story? That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were, were they were following the God of Israel, the, the one true God. And King Nebuchadnezzar raised this 90-foot statue of himself and said, everybody's got to worship it and you've got to bow down. And this is big whole, uh, big whole worship service. They had music and everything where they were supposed to worship him and not God. And they said, we can't do that. We worship God and God alone. So Nebuchadnezzar said, well, we're going to put you in the fire. We're going to turn it seven times hotter than we would have with anybody else because I'm raging mad. And they said, our God is able to deliver us. But if he, even if he does not, we won't worship you. We'll only worship him. Maybe we need that type of courage. The story finishes in case you don't know. Spoiler alert. They went into the fire. They didn't burn. Their, their clothes or hair even didn't even singe. And there was a fourth one in the fire with them. I think it was a pre-incarnation um, Christ, Christ, Christophany where Jesus himself appeared with him. 
You see, our God is able to save us, as they said, from even death or the fire. But what if he doesn't? Will we still worship him? Because at the end of the day, death has no power or victory over you and I. Because Jesus will bring us resurrected life eventually. But Jesus, dead things don't stay dead. So you and I can remiss, you can you and I can resist the enemy today, and when we resist him, he will flee. The fourth thing that we'll see, we see in verses seven through ten, and it says this: When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. You see, that's what he does. He deceives. That's his thing. Deception. At the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle, their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What we see, the third point is that Satan will try and try to deceive but he will ultimately fail deception is the only thing he knows so when this release happens it's his go to to deceive but he ultimately fails and eventually is cast into eternal fire and eternal torment but until then, let us keep faith that because we belong to the way, the truth, and the life, we don't have to be deceived by Satan. He has no power over us. But to counter deception, we must know the truth. And so may we devote our lives to living the truth of God's word. You want to know how to come against Satan and his deception the same way Jesus did in the in the, in the uh, wilderness when he was tempted he tempted and was, he did not sin because he spoke the word of God to Satan the word of God his truth is what keeps us from being deceived and then the final thing today and I pray that you'll hear these things with love and concern but I pray that you'll hear this clearly Satan and his entourage will endure eternal torment after all the torment that Satan has caused on earth for centuries, Satan will finally receive his eternal torment. He and everyone who follows his way, the beast, all these people, and anyone who's caught up with him. That eternal lake of fire also awaits anyone caught up in the lies that Satan purports. And so I must ask you today, what is your eternal destiny? Is it heaven or is it hell? Is it Jesus who wins or is it Satan who loses? Is it the king of kings or it is the dud of duds? The choice is yours. Choose Jesus. He wins. Satan loses. Pray today if you'd like to make a decision to follow Christ. Come, I'd love to share with you. We've got folks standing at the next steps, tables that would love to share with you as well. If you'd rather speak to someone outside uh, and have enough time to do that, grab me and I'll, I'll, I'll love to talk with you too. But whoever you need to speak with, we'd love to share with you how you can have confidence in Christ. I pray that we would all follow him with our lives and devote ourselves to the truth of God's word. Let's pray and let's respond. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. Your word is so clear that Satan's demise is eternal punishment, is eternal torment. And anyone caught up with him would endure the same, Lord. But life and light and freedom and eternal life belong to you so I pray today Lord even today that you would help someone to walk from death to life Lord because you make dead things alive Lord you don't dead things don't stay dead with you Lord 
And I pray that we would be able to receive the resurrection. Lord, and I pray that prophecy really would be that thing that anchors our souls and our hearts to know that you're coming, you win, and you've already won because of that. Satan has no power over us, those who are in Christ. So I pray you give us confidence to face whatever lies ahead. Yeah, it can be scary, it can be difficult, it can be daunting and ominous. But in you, we have hope in life. And we can take courage. Would you give that to us, Lord? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? As you stand, we're going to respond. If God is moving in your heart, you come. We're going to sing and worship Him as we close.